capture words. Use, in, use inventive spelling. Okay, babe, when you take your shoes off when you come back, because you're going to want the clippity clappity. How are you, sir? What's up? You doing all right? I'm doing great, sir. How are you doing? Well, you doing well. Your camera, bro. So yeah, yeah. Wipe your camera so you can you get a good good thing. You need to. Is it is it blurry? It's not blurry. You just need to. You can tell that you just need to take your thing and just do like this, like I'm doing this. Just clean it off. You Where's know? the camera? I don't even know where like the camera thing. is. Yeah, the little circle. You see the little circle at the top of your. Yeah, right there. Oh. That's that. Yeah, just take a thing. Now you don't got your fingerprints on it. Just yeah, okay. it's yeah, so we can see you good and clear. Now I gotta see where I put you. Hmm. Are you still there? I am here. Can you see me? I cannot. What did I do? To hold on. You got a touch screen. All right. Got me. I do. I see you in your office. Well, this is this is the this is the home office, man. So we yeah. are. Uh, I hear that. Yeah, you know. Should I clean up this background? No, great. You good? You okay. Know, well, not you. Just we're just having a, a good a good old conversation, man. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, you know, releasing this this book. Uh, we launched this book on the twenty first, man, and so, um, you know, this 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 whole thing has been a. a a, a real process yeah but uh you know the title learning happens through conversations you know five leadership lessons for masterful living and in the beginning part of the book uh you know we have this piece where i um was living in topeka kansas and then left yeah. and uh, i remember well yeah you were there you actually helped pack up uh that u-haul mm -hmm. so much to my chagrin at that time. At that time. But we got a little history, man. You know what I mean? You, when we were both teaching and then, um, uh, you know, then you becoming an administrator, you know, right around that time I moved. But uh, so I just kind of want to have a conversation, man. And just give people uh, a little bit of background on how we know each other. And then we'll, we'll go into, uh, you know, Talk, can talk about but, but just start just by talking just about uh you know how we know each other how we came to, to meet and, and all that and then we'll talk about uh you know this journey process and talk about some of these these conversations where learning happened yes well in in terms of us um meeting each other i, I remember it clearly uh actually it's funny how things start through church. You had moved to the uh, Topeka, Manhattan area uh, to get your master's degree. And I had just started working uh, on our district level with our church, uh, with the youth department in the state, of, with the churches in Kansas. And the church that you were going to, um, our collective pastor in Junction City, um, you know, uh, you were working with youth there and we just so happened to get on some same teams and committees. And I don't I don't know the very first meeting that you and I met. I don't know. I can't remember if it was in Topeka or Kansas City, but I remember I think it was in Topeka uh -huh. because I remember uh, around a table talking about various things with youth and I said, who is this new person that's moved here that's kind of feisty and that says whatever he wants to say? But I, I, I think our connection was because at the time uh, I was a high school teacher uh, and you were an elementary school teacher, if I'm not mistaken, uh, teaching elementary school or something to that or getting ready to. Uh, and so I think that we connected through the church end, but also on that end because we both were in the same thing. And I remember some of the conversations that we had because you were elementary focused and I was secondary focused. And so that just kind of um, 
spurred on and I think we exchanged numbers and I think that's before the advent of cell phones were really strong and so we did the old landline um, talking back and forth and I think through that uh, you know, and then, you know, coming to your house, you coming to ours and uh, just those conversations, I think, began uh, that relationship on all sides. So I do remember, when did you come to Kansas City area? I mean, Topeka area, 2001, 2000, somewhere around there? Uh, it was right. I came to, I went to grad school in 2000. Okay. I was, I was in Manhattan in 2000. And then I moved I moved to Topeka in 2002. Okay, right that, yeah. After, right after I got after grad school. So it was 2002 when I, when I Actually, if I'm not mistaken, you started grad school even before I did, because I didn't even start grad school. Well, I started grad school in 2001. And I think that was another connection because you were in grad school at K-State, my alma mater, and then I was in grad school in Kansas City. And so just kind of uh, those discussions as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, I left Topeka. I was in that administrative internship and then ended up leaving Topeka, Kansas. And uh, shortly after I left, um, you had gotten uh, an assistant principalship. Correct. In um, Kansas City, Missouri. And I remember uh, the school that I went to, uh, the then Southeast High School, was a school that a lot of people, I remember when I got hired in Kansas City, Missouri, I asked them to please send me to the school with the most need. Uh -huh. uh, I love, you know, I like urban education. Yeah, I love it. Right. Absolutely. She drove me to Southeast High School. Uh, her name was Dr. Phyllis Budesheim. She drove me to Southeast High School. It looks like a huge castle. But on the other side of them walls was some, uh, it was some stuff that was going on up in there. But I absolutely loved it because, you know, uh, it's just where the kids were. And it, it's, it, you know, so I, I started that job in 2003. So you're right. That's right about the time you left. I was going in to be an assistant principal uh, on the Kansas City, Missouri side. And so I think we had even more conversations then because I think you and I used to talk a lot about the Southeast was a very high need school. Mm -hmm. students had a lot of um, a lot of students had issues. Not all of them, but a lot of students had various issues, and we had a lot of things going on in the building, um, you know, that were probably negative for school culture in terms of just behaviors that were taking place and various different things. And so, I can remember many a late night talk strategizing because um, back in that day we had so many challenges in our school uh, with behavior, fires, fights, drugs, all those different kinds of things that were happening in the school. I remember I used to get to school around 6 o'clock a.m. just to get a solid hour of quiet mm -hmm. because I knew on 7.15. <laughs> it was about to be on. It was, it, and it was usually on and popping every day. But I was amazed at the educators in that building who didn't abandon ship, who didn't give up. And now I'm going to tell you, we had some teachers, Kobe, who would get up and just flat out. I remember one day, lady bought her stuff. I'm out. And I'm talking about this is in the first week. And I got it. I understood. And it didn't mean she was a bad person. It just, it wasn't for uh -huh. Some very good things at that school. And uh, the school was shut down some years later due to budgetary issues. But it's back open now. And I, I hear it's doing really well for the most part. So I remember those conversations like, Kobe, guess what has happened today? And I remember my very first day at Southeast High, school was over at 210, there was a riot fight outside and I'm this new 20 some year old administrator running out to it. And people were looking at me like, what are you doing? Uh, you do not know anything about these kind of fights taking place. And I didn't, but it, it gave me some street cred with the, with the kids. So, you know, I remember those days. <clears throat> let's, t let's talk about, um... Let's see, I, I, I was in Atlanta like 2004, 2005. And then mm -hmm. um, let's talk about when you had, um, we, we won't call the name, um, but a, a less than uh, effective principle that, that uh, was causing you to spurn. You know, we were talking probably, I don't know, three, four days a week. Like every okay. morning you were calling me coming in just talk, talk about that talk about talk a little bit about that 
those conversations, when I first became principal at uh, the head principal at the middle school I was at back on the Kansas side, mm-hmm. I did have an assistant principal. Uh, and let me just go through the back history. She probably, she was a very passionate educator, but she wasn't my selection. Uh, when I went and uh, took, the ju- took the position, I was basically assigned, I had interviewed her, but I was assigned that particular individual. I actually believe she had been promised a job. I was assigned to her. Her and I should have never been assigned together. Um, It's amazing when you go into a place and you know within day one that a person is working against you. Um, They had their own agenda. And I don't think that her agenda was against Donnie Mitchell per se, but it was her own agenda, period. And so I remember those those conversations um, because I I remember actually saying it's got to get to a point that it's – if she's going to be working with me at the school, then I need to be going to another school or, you know, things like that. But uh, there were a lot of philosophical differences that her and I had. So I remember, uh, uh, you know, us talking. And one of the things I can remember is us talking about, because, you know, you don't always want to approach every situation with a negative mindset. We were talking about one thing that I, I remember us talking about is growth mindset before growth mindset became was a thing phrase across the country, mm-hmm. you know, Absolutely. I think people just started talking about growth mindset in the past five or six years, but we're going, if we go back 15 years ago, we were talking about, you know, how can we approach this with a growth mindset and figure out the strengths of me, the strengths of her and how we can mesh those two together. And then those things that I don't do well and those things that she doesn't do well, we can figure out a way to work those together um, because her and I were probably in a place of impasse. We just Mm -hmm. flat out, Okay. Probably year two, we smiled and talk, and, mm-hmm. you know, um, which is not healthy either. You know what right. I'm saying? Because right. the I conversations are important, right? That is that is how you get to it, and through, right, you got you got you got to have a conversation. You got to talk about it. Um, yeah. yeah. And we, the the two of us, I think, had got to a place in the school where, and I will never say that we didn't, because we were never, there was never like any argument, there was never any rudeness, Mm -hmm. but I think I got to a place that I didn't trust her motives because of things that I had heard, and she probably didn't trust mine or didn't really know me, and so it caused us to, to be in a school, which you can't, which is not healthy, to be in a school where you have the principal and the vice principal who don't even speak. We spoke through the instructional coaches, which is not a growth mindset at all, but that's just kind of where it was. And so, you know, you have to, you get to a point that you have to own that. Um, And thankfully at that time, the school was so super small, but I I know the staff noticed the effects of that because it's, and we never count, we never contradicted each other, but it was clear we'd never interacted. And so, that, that's not a positive way to run any kind of school. And so those growth conversations that we had helped me figure out, hey, man, as the principal, you got to figure this thing out because ultimately that's your, that's, that's your responsibility. Yeah, and, and I think it just shows that everybody needs some coaching, right? Everybody, Absolutely. Um, you know, even when you're in positions of leadership, like coaching matters, like because – when you're leading people, sometimes you, you don't have anybody to have conversations with because they don't even get your perspective or, um, you know, you, they don't really understand the bigger picture of all mm-hmm. the things that you have to look at and people are narrowing their focus. So it's important that uh, when you're leading people, when you're leaving, when you're just living life in general, that, um, that you get some coaching, you know what I mean? Because it, it's necessary. It's important now. Um, so here's the piece. So, you know, we were doing some coaching there when I was going to, and so I moved to Atlanta to start my own consultant company. Um, and uh, so you become principal, you, you, you get your own school. Um, that person is gone. And then you're able to now have a budget. And so you bring me out to coach the school Mm -hmm. and, you know, the leadership staff. Uh, 2012, 2013, I think it, maybe 14, 15. Yeah, now I want to say we probably had a year of conversation, like if I get some money. If you get some money, right. So we talked that whole year 
about a year, uh -huh. maybe a year and a half. And then maybe when yeah. I got word from my executive director that, hey, you have this nice chunk of money, you may want to consider, do you want to bring in a consultant? And I think part of the conversation that you and I had, which I think those conversations were so vital because I said, you know, through our, through both of us talking, I don't want to bring in a math person or really. Right. Cause that's not what you need. Curriculum. I want to do something to bring in culture, to build capacity for culture. And so it was a new concept back then. Right. It was. Uh, I must say, because I, I got a lot of questions from people. Well, you got somebody, because a lot of schools were doing, oh, doing the science thing or doing project-based learning was a big thing back then. Right. What we decided to do at our school is say, we're not doing any of those because if the culture is not correct, oh, you project-based learn all you want. That's not going to do anything. And where, which I know we'll get into that in a minute, where we started to see achievement do this is when people were equipped with the skills to have... Uh, an engaging, positive, um, high expectation culture. Mm -hmm. and that's what shifted a lot of things academically. So the culture conversations happen for such a long time. And I can remember when we started, when you actually came, we did something different than most schools hadn't done. We shut down all, if you remember, beginning of the year PD at the school and yes. the Kaufman Center and rent, uh, rented out space in the, the, it's like a retreat. And that's, what, and that's what we called it, back to school retreat. Uh -huh. uh, I think, and I know I may be getting ahead of you, I feel like we started to see some changes instantaneously. Oh yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't take long. I think because when you decided to have a retreat, they hadn't had it before, right? And this wasn't a day. I remember having the conversation and you were saying, well, you know, okay, we're going to have this retreat. And, you know, I was thinking that we should do it a day. And I remember saying, well, Donnie, I, I think if we want to move, I, 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 need, to, I need to do it for three days. Mm -hmm. And I remember you're like, what? Like, wait a minute, hold on. Like, <laughs> like three days, like, what are you going to talk about for three days? And I said, well, you know, they're going to need to sit with this stuff. And, um, mm -hmm you know, we got to really bond them together. And in order to bond them together, they're going to need to spend some time together. And I think that taking them through some of those conversations of what do you really believe about education, right? What do you believe about students? Um, I remember, I remember this is giving them that homework, right? And saying that y'all have to bring this back tomorrow. And then they're like, well, we didn't have it. And then you stepping in like, well, no. Um, <laughs> your exact words, no, we're paying this man a lot of money. And um, no, y'all going to do this work. So if you, all, if you don't mind, Kobe, we're going to take a break here. And if you all did not do, there are computers out here in the hall. Uh, y'all going to go do this work. I remember and, that now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Y'all gonna, gonna go do this work, and then we're gonna take about twenty twenty five minute break, and then y'all gonna come back in here. But you're not gonna do, um, and uh, you know, you, you're not gonna come unprepared, and then expect students to come prepared. And then I remember you having that conversation with them, like, what would you do? What would you all do if you if you if you all were your students came in here unprepared like this? You know, you guys would be trying to write them up or give them a zero, you know what I mean? And you had that conversation that the same expectations that we hold uh, our students to are the same expectations that we have to hold ourselves to. You know, now that you mentioned it, I do remember that because I remember that some of the early conversations that you had with staff, some people got uncomfortable and some people got angry because when you are trying to go out of the box and push thinking, all of us have to own the fact that when our own personal thinking is pushed, it does cause us discomfort, which I think was why it was so necessary to go to the retreat center because the atmosphere was conducive to, it was conducive to seriousness, but it was also conducive to learning just the way that the place is set up. And then of course, if you remember, we wined and dined our staff, uh, yes. breakfast, lunch, two snacks, and uh, it wasn't sandwiches. These these were some some meals. But I, I do remember that. And the what I remember also through that process is that by them doing the homework and really stretching their thinking, what what was in my mind as a one day retreat, which ended up turning into three days, uh, if you recall, ended up turning into where we were able to 
have days where we had professional development sessions for our staff when you came in and presented the work about shifting the mindset, the learning happens in a conversation. And I, I, you know, what, what's so vital about the learning happens in a conversation, I think that we have to remember the initial conversation may produce a wall. Right, absolutely. Because it's gonna be a barrier. We wanna have our, we don't, none of us really wanna have our parameters pushed, but then once you get past that, and the conversations may have to be forced, but then if you can recall, we got to a place of synergy in some of those first couple of years of retreats that you almost had to stop the conversation from, mm -hmm. not almost had to, you had to stop because, hey, we gotta be out of here by four o'clock. But uh, to see that transformation, not only with the staff, but even my leadership team, when you have the right people in the right seat, that transformation led to a lot of different ways that we think about um, our kids and the, uh, a lot of the ways that we think about the, because I think one of the things that you used to point out and that I remember you t talking to some of our PLCs with some of our instructional coaches is that our kids have the same capacity, if not more than others. But if you don't believe, I think you did a poem or something about uh, belief. And uh -huh. if you don't believe in me, uh, there's no way, and I, I say this to this day, there's no way that you can teach a kid that you don't believe in. And uh, you can teach a kid you may not always like, but you got to believe in them. And even the mantra, if you recall, we developed the mantra at that school, and I have it at my school now. Our school is not good enough until it's good enough for your child to be able to go here. And until you can answer that question, we got work to still do. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that, that's where a lot of that emanated from, is from those learning happens in a conversation, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. I think those were good. I think the conversation with the staff and us actually turning and shifting that school. Um, but I think what was even more powerful than the whole school was the leadership conversations that we had with your leadership uh, yeah. team. Um, some of those morning and then when we would go off campus and, uh, eat lunch, um, and then even our one-on-one -on -one after school where we would end up being at school to sometimes six and seven, uh, at night. Um, talk about what you think those conversations did and, uh, even, you know, maybe what we had talked about in some of those conversations that really helped move your school? Um. Well, I, I think, first of all, the atmosphere was a safe place. And I want to point this out. As the culture of the school began to shift and our leadership team was able to go off campus and have lunch and have these conversations. Now, let me put it out there. My bosses were aware, y'all, that we were out, <laughs> out there. Let it be known. <laughs> I think it really spoke to the distance that the school had come that we were able to do that because, you know, we, we might leave for an hour and come back and the school was in perfectly great shape. Mm -hmm. But I think what it provided is a safe place, like a sounding board. So some of those during school conversations involved the entire leadership team where no idea was a bad idea. And if you can right. remember, mm -hmm. I had the whiteboard installed in my office mm -hmm. and so we would take notes, but it was a it was a safe place in terms of as you are our consultant talking to our leadership team. Uh, if you didn't think something was a good idea or thought we should think about it, I think that we had created a space to where, uh, not the word dumb, but like, are you kidding me? Is that what you're really thinking about? That type of thing. And what you ended up having was several people who all had our own personality and our own strengths. Where able to bring conversation to the table back so okay, we need to look at the master schedule different we need to look at the implementation of this different and so what those coaching conversations did uh, is it pushed the thinking to that no longer do you have to do it this way because this is how it's always been done we have the budget we have the funds to be able to do it the way that we think that we want to do it. And then, you know, we would always run it by the people that were above us. But I think what, what we did at our school at that particular time in history, if you can recall, 
we did so many uh, innovative things through those late conversations and they weren't, and I remember, I remember you telling one of the staff members if, uh, who was saying, you know, wow, uh, y'all just really got it together and, and y'all make the big bucks and you made a statement to th this particular young man and you said, the money is seen, you know, as you see us now, it looks like we have the money, but you're not present for these three and four hour conversations to where we're doing the work while we're not getting paid because the school has got to push. We got to move achievement. Mm -hmm. And so um, what I do remember happening is through those coaching conversations and through flat out, if this is the way that you've always done it, just scrap it. We're going to come up with something totally brand new and a new way to do this and to think about it. And I can remember that we got to a place in terms of that synergy. And I think you can remember this. Other schools would want to come to our school. What are y'all doing? And then they started to take you away from our school and put you in other schools uh, uh, to my being upset because I'm like, I'm paying for him to be here and you all are taking him away from me because I remember one of the executive directors actually saying, you know what, your school has now got to this place, you don't need it. And I'm like, this is when we need it the most because that's, of the come on. You know, that's where the coaching conversations and the us pushing each other back and forth is needed to sustain it. But then the next thing I know, you're in three or four other schools and gone from us. But <laughs> the, point, the point that I'm making, and I think that you can remember this, when we would go to district meetings, and you remember we had the district PDs, or we'd all go to the local high school that's up the street from our school, we would have people were coming like, what? we want to go to your school. We want to, you know, who is that? What are you all doing over there? And what it was is, the more you have conversation, the more your thinking will get pushed past what is normal and what is typical and you start moving into i'm not using a spiritual term but i'm saying this you start moving into more supernatural kind of thinking mm -hmm. this is outside of the box if a kid uh and if you can recall one of the conversations that we had as our leadership team that we pushed how do we educate those students who are not successful during their regular school day and it's from those conversations that we start developing in school alternative programs, after school programs where the kid wasn't in trouble, right. but if the kid is struggling from eight to three, let's reduce the day, let's do some different creative things. And I remember that program. Yeah, because that was that was strong. That was that we got a lot of pushback. I remember that because um, the school within the school. Right, That's we we what it was called. <laughs> we, we had a school within the school, and that came up because there were certain students who were always in trouble, always, you know, you know and to the point uh, where we were sending them home. And I remember that whole idea came up because I said, "What if we adopted the policy?" that we were not gonna suspend students. Mm -hmm. What if we really believed that school was the best place for all students, even the ones who have issues you know, with discipline? What if we decided that we were not gonna suspend any students at all? What does that look like? And from from that conversation and from those conversations we moved into a realm of okay now we've got this school in a school we've got these 12 to 15 kids who are with one teacher mm -hmm. and again that caused us to have to shift budgets and be right. think outside the box but if you can remember what spurred on through that conversation and through and let me say this when you really have a learning conversations it's nothing if you don't begin to move to implementation mm, come on man so it just it moves the frustration, right? You got to move, right? You, so you got to move. The mm -hmm. knowledge, mm -hmm. in and of it, knowing something doesn't really help you unless you now do something with that knowledge, right? Exactly. Because you know what happens is is you'll end up frustrated, right? You'll end up Absolutely. frustrated, Absolutely. you know, mm -hmm. constipated and frustrated is what you is what Absolutely. you know, <laughs> and Absolutely. so what you cannot have is just the talking about good ideas. And I think that that was difficult for your leadership to, um, to, 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 to champion because, you know, my thing was to push y'all. So 
You're like, we got this idea. I'm like, let's do it. And then you take it to them and they're like, well, let's send it out to the people and, you know, let's have some, you know, meetings around it to see. And I'm like, we ain't got time to wait. Like we got this issue now. We see a solution. You know, we, let's do it. And I, and I applaud you because you took some, some risk um, as principal where you just said, we're, we're just going to do it. And then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll apologize, you know, Oh, I, I didn't know that, that we couldn't, you know, shift this thing around like that, you know, and then, uh, remember some of the powers that be, I won't say names, some of the powers that be once the data start being realized and our suspension rates, and this is what actually happened to everybody that's out there watching our suspension rates actually did this, but achievement did this. And it was happening with kids who were getting written up 20 and 30 times in a month or, you know, or whatever the case may be. Um, but because out of that came mentoring programs and other types of things, bringing in guest speakers. And some of those kids who were the most volatile, once you sat down and got to know them, they really weren't volatile at all. They had other issues going on. And then some of the power, if, and I said this, let me, I'll finish this statement. If you recall, some of the powers that be were then able to take credit. Well, look at the data that's going on in the West. And you know what? I don't have a problem with it. If you if you take credit for it, then you because I think Kobe, I wanna I wanna put this out there too that the school that we were that I was at that you came in and was a consultant was in the highest poverty and crime zip code in Kansas City, Kansas. And you can remember there were people by the hundreds who weren't sending their students uh, to our school. They just flat out weren't because they were scared for safety. And from year one, when we had 240 kids, and I think by the time you left, we had actually got up in the 700s. Yeah, and just it was crazy. Three or four yeah. years, and then ultimately got it to like 950. But, and what happened is then, which is crazy, but if you recall. Like you yeah, some some people some people in the powers that be then shifted their thinking like, well, what is going on there? That so many people want to come there, and the sad thing is, from some from some colleagues in the district, start getting pushback. Like, if you recall, our school must be cheating. We must be promising people <laughs> stuff. We must be doing all these things that are illegal. And I'm like, what are we doing? We just have families who sense the shift mm -hmm. and want to come back. But you remember some of those very people you've seen some of the emails that i was sent like you all must be down there just letting kids do anything they want to do and then we're like why don't you come see come walk through the hall go wherever you want to go and you will see it's not any kind of chaos going and it wasn't and then people would come down to the school and see that there wasn't chaos oh you must have a lot of people absent today or y'all must be hiding people somewhere and i think you and i and some of the other members of the leadership team in some of those after school conversations, we're able to sit there and laugh like people really feel like these kids are coming down here playing basketball all day and that's not what they're doing. Yeah. But so as I look back on it now, it's comical, but it all happened by recognizing where we were at the entry point of the conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and when you, when the learning happens in the conversation, there's going to be some that are crucial. There's going to be some that are uncomfortable because when you're in a school district and you want to do things out of the box, you are correct. That is one thing I will tell you that you um, really imparted to our leadership team is just do it. And it does, if people don't like it, apologize later, do it long enough. If you go ahead and do it, when they find out about it, they come and see it and they say, wow, this is really working. And then some of the very things that we were told initially no on, and we did start popping up in all the other middle mm -hmm. schools. Isn't that, when, isn't, that, isn't that funny? Yeah. I thought what was interesting um, too about this whole piece was when, uh, you know, that I think that was when the, I, I, I started doing the turn. They were like, well, is he, you know, because I would go to y'all's leadership meetings with you all. And they were like, Correct. who is, who is that? And then I think that's when you came, you and I came up with, we're just going to start calling you the culture coach. Like that's our culture coach, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, they're like, Oh really? What, what is that? So like, what does he do? So is he help you with man? Like he helps us with all of that. Like he's a, he's a master teacher. So yeah, he teaches teachers. He, he works with students. He does some stuff with parents. They're like, Oh, but what does he do? Like he's helping us with everybody. Like he coaches us. Um, you know, and I think that that was the piece. And then I thought it was interesting that shortly after that, then 
that's what positions start trying to come up in schools. Right? Uh, it came up in our district, so you know. Um, <laughs> How I, I, so I don't know if you remember that. Uh, if you remember that one budget meeting we, uh, that I took you to, yeah. and I, I start. Uh, this is when we had our budget request, and I start asking for money. Like, I want to feed my staff two or three times a month because we're going to have conversations and have fellowship mm -hmm. to help lead us to where we got to go, and it ended up getting approved. But then, then the word is. All they do down there is eat. And, you know, that's all they do down there and eat. But having PLCs and groups of teachers meet around, uh, whether it be Pete's, whatever it was, and having those conversations because the staff, they, they, like, they care for us. And, you know, you know, many a days we would tell the staff, don't get any lunch. We're going to deliver lunch to you today. We're going to deliver breakfast to you today. Or stop by my office and get yourself a treat before you go home. Though, I mean, that was that was a base of some things that we did. But I remember when that budget got approved, like, uh, and I'm like, just trust me, it's going to work. And then all of a sudden, we start hearing from some of the powers that be, you know, many of them are not there anymore. All of a sudden, you know, the district needs, we need to really look into uh, in addition to an instructional coach in the building, having someone to coach culture. And then what ended up happening is that's when you got pulled from us, even though it was my school's budget, you got pulled from us and they made you the culture coach at a couple of other middle schools and some elementary schools during that work. And then I can remember some conversations that you got pulled to uh, the actual district office, having those conversations. And I'm like, okay, our culture coach was here. He's <laughs> Uh, and it was almost like you were in Kansas City so much that you almost became like an employee uh, of the district. But I think what ended up happening is people started seeing, and it's not just opening up, sitting down and picking a, a card out of a box and start talking. Right, it's, no, it's, it's, it's some conversations it's, it's, with an end goal in mind. And many of those conversations intended to get to the root cause of what an issue is. And if you can recall, some of those coaching conversations, not just for staff, but for the leadership team, came with homework. We got to read this. We're going to study this. And, you know, uh, you travel with us to a lot of PDs and other schools that we're studying this because the goal was to push our student achievement. And if you recall, we had highly qualified staff members in our school, but achievement wasn't pushing. So it wasn't about math and reading. It wasn't about that. It had to become about strategy and belief and going deeper than just books on teaching kids about poverty, going deeper into uncovering our own personal mindsets and not focusing on what the kids got to do different, but focusing on, okay, we have the kids we have, we love them. And I can remember you and I telling the staff, if we get rid of all the kids that are causing us issues, we won't be working, we won't have jobs. Mm -hmm. So we gotta take the kids that we're given, their parents send us the best that we have, and we gotta change what we do. Mm -hmm. That is where, when we started to change our own mindset, and if you can remember the one year, maybe the last year you were there, we did a focus, you know, after we started with conversations, if you remember we did a PD focus for a whole year. Yeah positivity and growth. Like I said, before growth started, before the mindset growth started, positivity. If it wasn't positive, you couldn't say it. And I can remember the superintendent coming into our school. If you remember her, it's just feels it different. feels different. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I so remember that because yeah. um, at the beginning of the year, um, and, and, and to her credit, she you know, when, when you start talking about that in the budget, she wasn't necessarily on board and, you know, at the beginning of the year, but about midway, I, I'll, I'll never forget, like she walked right in and she probably took about four steps and, it's more. and just, it's more. It, it was just like, it, it, it just feels different in here. Like it just feels different. And which was notable because it was our school, because our school was a school that always had given substitute teachers bad vibes. And if you can recall, as we started making those shifts in conversation, I know you remember this, we would have substitute teachers request only to come to our school. Yeah. We, had on, we had teachers on a waiting list. Like if there's an opening, I wanna, so if you recall, because as we started to move into different interview protocols and start, because I think you had told us about an interview protocol 
Don't ask them questions. Just have a conversation. That's it. Let them talk. And within 10 minutes, you're going to know if this person is someone that you need to have. But if you can recall, we got to the point that I had to start uh, dividing out interviews because we'd have one position Mm -hmm. or two positions open and 15, 16 people that were all highly qualified applying. And I don't know if you remember, uh, it wasn't the superintendent, one of our executive directors came in one time. Uh, she looked like us and she walked in the building whew, and started crying. It just, it just something about this place. It's just, do you remember that? I absolutely do. Uh, are you at a middle school or at the Pentecostal church? Which one are you at? So, you know. Energy, the energy of it was different though, but, but we shifted not only the conversations we were having in the leadership team, right? Mm-hmm. But working with teachers on how you talk to students. Yes. Right? But then also working with students on how students talk to students. Right? Absolutely. How students talk to staff. So um, I think that that was the thing was shifting really the energy of the building came from the energy of the people themselves, right? Absolutely. And so if you want to move, because this is what we always hear, right? Schools are failing kids. Um, but schools are made up of people, right? And so it's not schools that are failing kids. It's people who are failing kids. That was a huge piece. And, Kobe, I, didn't, I don't mean to cut you off, but if you can recall, when the, as the culture started shifting and we started realizing, and I, I do remember you saying this to our staff, uh, and to our leadership team, because I remember the first time you said it, I was quiet. Like, we, you all, we are failing these kids. That is something that is uh, a slap in the, not, not a slap in the face in a bad way. It's a, it's a jog you wake you up because yeah. you can't get mad because the data says what it says. And it's not even just about the data because where we took our stuff is deeper than data. Because if you recall... I don't think you remember this, but through those conversations, it came about that we asked you to create a survey for culture that we gave our kids. Yeah. And if you remember, we let the kids take a survey and then we had to go in professional learning in the cafeteria and sit around the round tables and look at what our kids said about us. That was one of the most eye opening times because now This kid is not even talking about a specific teacher. This kid is talking about how they feel when they come in the building. And after a couple years, it went from, let's say on a scale of zero to 10, they felt a three. Mm -hmm. But then by the time it was over, they felt a nine or a 10. And if you can recall, it was about that time, which I had people say, how in the world did you all do this? If you can recall when the proposal went on the table to add 20 additional teacher work days to the schedule, and 98% of our teachers had no uh, issue. Said yes. No issue, right. no problem. We early and we will go into the summer. And that's when you knew that I even had district people say, okay, this is how we know there's a shift because these people are giving up three weeks of their summer and coming back early. And I think we had, if you remember, one or two teachers transferred because of their childcare schedules just wouldn't work but nobody else left. And the two or three that didn't really like it, by the time it was in the second year, it was like, this is how we do business. That's when you started to see, you know, some turn. Mm. Wow, man, yeah, it, it, it is uh, the work, right? It's, it's, in, it's in the doing that the work gets done. Mm-hmm. And uh, we did some stuff. Well, I know you gotta go here, but before we leave, I wanted you to talk a little bit um, about this book right um, just just talk about you because you had a chance to read it and uh, just just some of your, your your takeaways and because like I said it is my journey but um, there's some other stuff in there that I, I just want you to talk about what what were your takeaways in there well my takeaways and I want to say when I received the book um, I think my wife was at an appointment, my kids were playing quietly, and I said, let me just sit up and read. Uh, What started out with me gonna read just a couple of pages, I read the entire thing that evening. But I will tell you some of the takeaways. Well, first of all, the, the personal, 
the personal shares and the personal testimonies about how your own thinking got shifted. And one of the, there's several takeaways that I took away from the book. One of the takeaways is, is if we as individuals and professionals don't shift how we think, and if we don't start changing the parameters of our thought process, we will always be in the same place that we are. And so another takeaway is we have to actually write out what it is we want to see. And from there, uh, another takeaway is you got to find someone who's already where you are or who is doing more than what you're doing and learn. Hear the hard conversations when they tell you this thought process is not going to get you where you want to go. Instead of, instead of taking that personal, say, you know what, if I want to make, because I think, I think you mentioned a certain dollar amount that you wanted to make per month. And so what you did is had a conversation with someone who was at that level and above. Mm -hmm. And some of the things that that person might have said to you may have not felt the best. But what you had to do is swallow your pride and robe yourself in humility and say, I need to listen to what you're saying. And so uh, the step by step process of how to what my takeaway is learning happens in the conversation is you had to shift your thinking. And another thing, which something that I have to do better with is take risks. You know, you, you took some risks that were that were uh, that were just different. You took some risks that most people wouldn't have taken. I'm going to stop what I'm doing. I have this job offer come to me, mm -hmm. this job offer that's going to pay me good money, double of what I'm making now. Yeah. I'm going to turn it all down and I'm going to pick up and get in my truck and I'm moving to a place that I've not lived before. That in itself is a risk. But then what you had to do is trust yourself with the risk that I'm going to meet the right people who are going to put me in the right path. Uh, another takeaway, if I recall from the book, is you talked about some jobs that you did once you got there that weren't in your degree field, but you had to do, you had to, do to eat. And I feel like that was powerful because on the path of getting where you want to go, you may sometimes have to do some stuff you don't want to do, mm -hmm. but it's temporary. Right, right move you to a better place. And so my huge takeaway was just the advice that you took and the copious notes that you took from those who knew more than you to learn and to shift your thinking and to take your thinking to a place that I'm not sticking in this traditional box. I'm going to push outside the box and just see where it takes me. Because you always know you got, as a teacher, you always got something you can fall back on. But it wasn't even, you, there was something in the book where you talked about to the, to the equivalent of failure is not going to be an option. I'm not not going to do this. Mm -hmm. It may take me a month. It may take me three months. But I'm not not going to succeed. Right. It's a fun deal. That mindset will force you, as you said in the book, when you make up your mind that you're going to do something, it's going to force you to get up and do the work. You won't. You can't sit on the sofa. Oh, I'm going to be a millionaire, but I'm going to sit here another day. I'm going to watch Judge Judy another day. Mm -hmm work that way you got to get up and you got to go make it happen meeting people taking notes and now look where you are so I took from the my main takeaway is if the thinking doesn't shift then the progress doesn't shift mm -hmm. yeah good stuff man mm -hmm. well, I appreciate you man I appreciate you likewise I'm out, of your, out, of your, out of your busy day I knew that you were the you know principal at a at a at your, at your new position um you know, talk, you know, you can go ahead, shout out, shout out to school, man, and, and, and uh, the church pastor, you know, let them know, let, let them know who you are. Go ahead and give them credentialize, man. We want to let, let the people know. Y'all come to Kansas City, come on to Lee A. Talbert Community Academy Charter School, kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, we are on a quest to become the best and highest achieving school in Kansas City, and we are going to do that. Pandemic or not, we're going to do that. And uh, my church is on the Kansas side, New Jerusalem Apostolic Church, better known, AKA New Jack. And uh, I'm gonna put this shameless plug in there, 2601 North 55th Street, Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, <laughs> NewJackKCK.org, that's what we got. <laughs> Go ahead and let them know, man. Well, I appreciate you, man. And uh, sir, I, I, I appreciate you, you know, uh, you know, buying books for your staff and, uh, you know, leadership and school. I appreciate the support, and yes, uh, sir. you know, what I mean, like I said, we'll get out there and, and 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 do what we did to that school, like we did the other one. It's just gonna be a continuation, yes, sir. Absolutely. So we appreciate you too. All right, bro. I appreciate you, man. All right. All right. Okay. 
talk to you soon. Yes, sir.